welcome everybody. It's a big pleasure for me to have um, Uwe here tonight, um, who is one of the most reputable guys from the Berlin ecosystem. Um, one of the original um, people at Rocket Internet, who actually was involved in some of the most reputable startup firms himself by um, incubating Groupon, Wimdu, eDarling, and several other very successful ventures before he actually decided to uh, start his own VC firm with uh, some other people from Rocket Internet, which is Project A Ventures, you of course all know that. It's an operational VC firm, which is a little bit different from uh, many others, so they've really found a strong value proposition and are very close to their founding teams, which is why I believe that um, having Uwe here tonight is actually a fantastic opportunity to talk a little bit more in detail about what does it mean in order to invest in great teams. So Uwe, um, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Impressive space. So thanks a lot to the guys at McKinsey. Um, I also now understand that the motto is build your own McKinsey. If, if somebody would have accepted my CV a couple of years back, maybe would have had the chance. But uh, <laughs> this is my, uh, it's my first time to get to experience McKinsey from the inside. So <laughs> it's pretty, it's not how I pictured it, but. Uh, yeah, it's great. It's a fantastic space, I agree. Uwe, Throughout your career, um, being a pure startup guy, um, you've seen so many different founding teams. So from your perspective, what are some common characteristics among great founders? So, I mean, in our industry, I mean, you know this as well, and probably you would agree, um, none of us really knows what they're doing. Uh, I think that's a more fundamental truth about startups that nobody really has a clue, you know, what's going to happen. Um, we don't, you know, we try to predict the future, but it's pretty useless. Um, and um, th the best proxy that we really, really have when making an investment decision uh, for the future of a startup and ultimately the, the monetary success that has, c has to come through that is investing in teams. And now that's, that's pretty common wisdom, yeah? You'll find it on every shitty entrepreneurship blog around the world saying, oh yeah, team so important, but it really is mainly because we don't have anything really, anything really substantial that's different than, than evaluating the teams. Um, and that comes from the fact that really we are sailing into the unknown. Uh, all the business cases will be completely useless, basically. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, and you get punched in the face quite quickly, and that's when you want to rely on a good team. So that's why we spend a lot of time on that. And now if you go, if you, if you, if you go you know, asking the list of criteria, how do we evaluate them? You can easily find a list of, you know, like obvious criteria. You know, it should be smart and ambitious and driven and charismatic. And that's probably all not going to be re really surprising. Um, I think two or three things that are maybe are still kind of easy to understand but are super important for us. One is, even though they are excellent in what they do, they're probably also good at explaining it to people who have no idea what this is about. Um, and that is a good test because, of course, they need to be experts in their domain and they will have spend a lot of time in it and be very deep in the trenches. But people are really good at explaining and teaching others about what they are doing, um, typically tend to be doing quite well. It has something to do with being able to explain a strategy you know, to investors, to a company, to your employees, to potential new joiners. Um, I think that's very important. Let, let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about what we do day to day. So I understand all those criteria, but how do you test this? Because yeah. you have a very limited amount of time available yeah. to actually check this out. So what yeah. do you do? So I think the, uh, we, we, we specifically check for one thing in the whole process, which we call you know, that people have a certain level of intellectual humility. Um, we deal with a lot of people who are super smart. Obviously, all of them much smarter than we are and experts in their field. Uh, but some of the best entrepreneurs we have seen walk into every situation, even, you know, it doesn't matter if it's with, an, uh, with a competitor, with a supplier, with an investor, with a team member, with the intern who just had his last day, kind of with an attitude, I can learn something from this. Um, I'm not really sure yet what I'm going to be able to learn, but I don't think I have reached the maximum of, of savviness, of knowledge already. And that is one very good indicator, and I think you can observe that very well in due diligence. Um, so we're totally fine with people in due diligence approaching this as a very interactive uh, session, asking questions, what do you think about this? That's how we see it. What, what do you think about it? Um, if we did reference calls you know, on, on the business model, on the people asking, so what can we learn from that? Kind of soaking up knowledge. 
Um, that's typically what, what separates the, the great from the good, because separating great from good is, I think, what, what our business really is about. It's pretty easy to find out if early on if an idea is really shitty. So if we get a business case that really is not going to fly, probably we'll, we're pretty good at figuring out quickly and, and providing feedback. But what's super hard is to understand whether this is a good idea or a great idea. And oftentimes, you can't really do that, and you have to rely on the, uh, rely on the team. And that is one important aspect. So the teaching capability that I said before, that you, you can just experience yourself, right? Typically, I walk into like a lot of situations saying, hey, just pretend uh, I know nothing about this business, tell me. That's fairly easy for me to pretend because it's actually the truth, right? I have no idea. And, and sometimes we go like, hey, explain it to me like I'm a 10-year-old. And then we listen and we wait and then we go, okay. Explain to me like I'm a five-year-old, uh, because you really need to uh, need to understand, of course, and um, that is fairly easy to I, th I think to assemble. We pay close attention how people also, like entrepreneurs, treat other people than us around us. Um, you know, we know if somebody was rude to the receptionist. We we kind of we kind of get that feedback somehow. It's not something that we explicitly ask, but. We have a living organization. We have 100 people working in the company, operational experts that work with the team on due diligence, and we, we get a feeling for how, 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 how people operate. Now, there's always brilliant jerks, right? There's always people who are just brilliant, but they're just really hard to stand. And that is one of the toughest questions, probably. How do you deal with those people in your own team when it comes to recruiting and setting up your own team, or when it comes to evaluating investments? You can probably hold the bus. That's what Phil Jackson used to say. You can hold the bus for one guy, right? So there is maybe you know, one or two people around which you can create a bit of a bubble and protect them uh, if, they're, if they're weird uh, before it becomes toxic. And that is a tough question when it comes to evaluating investments. I'm sure you've had the same, yeah, you know, sure. where people are probably brilliant, but also probably just assholes. And How it do becomes you even more difficult because several people from different investment teams have different opinions on what they like. So also even though you have a process yeah. that helps you to identify yeah. the characteristics of a founding yeah. team, you will still have your personal taste. Yeah, of What's course. What's your personal yeah. taste? What's my personal taste? I mean, in terms of teams, I like people who I think are super fast learners. I like situations in where I don't have to rely on any kind of prediction, but think about people who will just adapt fast enough. And um, that is much more, yes, of course, you have to have like a certain mind, like mental capabilities, but mostly like a willingness to learn. Uh, and I think if you approach everything like a little learning um, experience, then I think that works very well. And that's, by the, one, by the way, one of the core strengths that Rocket Internet had. Um, um, an immense learning speed. And I think that's a big task for every entrepreneur who set up his own team, at, optimized for something that is almost like an organizational metabolism, metabolism. I think you can say that. Probably native speakers hopefully understand me. It's like a, a throughput speed of an organization. Like, that is one of the fundamental tasks, I think, of an, en of an entrepreneur, of, an, of a founder. Am I able to create an organization that is a fast learning organization in general? Over the last 10 years, you have been involved in the startup scene, roughly, and you've been funding and starting a lot of businesses. So it's besides been the fucking up a tremendous amount yeah, of time. Of course, also, yeah. of course. And among those skills that you've just mentioned, like being a fast learner, how, how important is it from your experience to have technical skills as a co-founder? Um, so like a pretty broad you know, skill set among a lot of things, and then have specific uh, functional areas in which you're really good. I think we are moving as an industry towards a, uh, a, a scenario in which a lot of cool new fields will come into play. You know, I've actually been in this industry for 12 years, shockingly, so uh, it makes me feel very old, but back then we all just built online shops for X, and as we all know, those times are long gone. And, but suddenly, one of the companies we just invested in is, um, uh, is in the basically in the autonomous driving technology enabling space. And yeah, there's a, there's a business guy, but you know, the times of luxury where you could just have a team of three generalists kind of tackling the business with like a business school mindset and uh, it's gonna be tough. So I think you have to have this ambition uh, to really create the, the lower part of the T. Yeah, I agree. We have uh, one question from uh, Philip, who is from the Startup Notes audience, and he asked if it is a good idea to start a company with a friend. It's a double-edged sword, in, in a way. Um, it c obviously, it can be fantastic and can be super rewarding, and you're basically building this amazing company with your friend, and you, 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 know, you ride off in the sunset with the billions that you made, and it's great. Um, 
But I think definitely if you want to do that, you have to have some working experience together before. You know, you either should have spent like some super intense times at university, maybe you worked in a similar company before, you should really have tried out how do you work together. And the answer is yes, I think it could be a very cool tool, but make sure that you spend at least six months in the trenches together before that. Because once, um, once you start, it's kind of worse than a marriage because you kind of can break, you, know, you can divorce, but like it's, it gets messy with a company. You have like hundreds of children. Let, let, let's continue on this point, like starting a company with a friend or not friend, doesn't matter. But like, is there, from your point of view, like what is the perfect split of equity? If you and me would start a company today, so how would you do that? <laughs> um, I think there's two ways to do it. Um, I think either you have a situation where there is a very, very clear hierarchy and it's obvious and everybody has no problem accepting that, um, or you don't, then you go for equal. I, I personally like the situations where somehow people are equal and there is like a, a recognition among I in this team <coughs> saying, hey, we're in this together, Everybody of us will give it, you know, as much as they can. Sometimes more, sometimes less. You know, sometimes people need to take a break and breathe, and we shouldn't get uh, get in discussions. Oh, you don't pull your weight. So, for example, if you and I would start a company, I would definitely go for even distribution. Just Thank because, you. Of, yeah, no, but uh, <laughs> just because I hope you wouldn't screw me over and uh, demand more than I do. No, because I think um, I think it just gives a better energy. You know, if if somebody starts a company with a guy you know, who has IPO'd three companies, then maybe yeah. it's different. Uh, then it's very different. But if we talk about a set of, of people of similar rank, personally, and there's other people who fundamentally disagree with me and think this is a stupid opinion. There's those people who read this book about 3G capital in Brazil. Yeah. That's kind of like a Bible for people who love meritocracy. And it's all about basically like, it's not stabbing each other in the back, but kind of like if you really want to create a healthy, uh, paranoia and competition among people. And that's probably good for some people. I just personally very much like that if you are somewhat on a similar level, let's even it out. And it, I think it gives, to me personally, it gives a better feeling of, um, um, you know, of we're all in the same boat. No, but I, I agree on what you say, and I, I would do the very same thing. The, 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 the some, something that we observe sometimes is that it becomes more difficult to make decisions in a team because like, it feels like that just because you have equal ownership, it means yeah. that y you know, everybody has the same say, yeah. and that of course is a problem. So and that, yeah, that, is probably, that, that is true, but I think if, if your decision-making process is down to a situation where it, you know, it comes down to the voting shares that you have, and you kind of, hey, we should make the, the, the decision based on, in the founding team, you have 12% and those two guys have 8%, yeah. so you have more. If it comes down to that, I think you have a fundamental problem probably somewhere else anyway, because either you have a decision-making process and then it should be, I think it should be detached from whether it's 12% or 7% or 6%. No, I agree, very true. Um, speaking of equity, um, what do you do in order to attract new talent? So let's talk a little bit about, about ESOP. What, what is a good size for an ESOP pool? Yeah. How would you distribute that? Um, do you offer everyone ESOP? Do you just give ESOP to special people? Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. So it's a, it's a very good question. It's um, science. Huh? It's a little bit of science as well. It's a little bit of science and also it's probably some dark magic yeah. somewhere in there. Um, I think that the, the book on the topic was written by the guys from Index Ventures. Uh, I'm sure you know, if, you, if, you, if you Google a little bit, then um, they did the best quantitative study. Um, I think it's always a good idea to be generous on the ESOP pool for companies. Um, you know, if, if a company comes with 10, 15% of ESOP pool, we don't see it as a, as a negative, uh, rather as a positive. Um, I think um, in Germany, we still have a culture among employees that people don't really get yet what ESOP you know, really uh, like means. Uh, people sometimes are a bit suspicious of it and think, okay, am I being screwed here? Or they just want, do they just want to take away some of my salary? So it's a bit of a complicated issue. Um, I think ultimately we should, hopefully we'll move into the direction where you know, companies basically are able to distribute ownership among a lot of people. Um, it has some problems, as, you, as I'm sure you know, with the German tax system yeah, sure. and, and stuff like that. So um, I hope this will, be, uh, this will change eventually because I think it's going to be great. I think in Germany we are lagging behind some other companies, you know, where we, uh, some other countries where we see every employee basically gets, gets ownership. We don't have that appreciation yet for, for that topic in Germany. I think it's probably starting um, to grow. And I, I, think, I think the takeaway is to be generous. And if you can attract people 
for whom generally ease up is a good thing, you should be happy. Yeah. You should be very happy to give this out. Um, uh, and the calculation is quite simple. You know, if you just take the dilution for your package, and if you don't believe that person will create that incremental amount of value, then probably it's not a good hire. And most of the times you'll probably come to the conclusion that, wow, that's awesome. You know, this person is going to make me richer. I definitely have to hire her or him. How do you see the role of the CEO? So common wisdom says that a CEO has yeah. like certain functionalities and yeah. he does maybe a little bit of strategy, hiring, whatever. So how, how do you see that? Yeah, so, so the, the, the classic three are, you know, you have to provide vision for the company to make sure that everybody sits in the same boat, rows the same direction and knows what they're, what they're doing. And there's a couple of methods, you know, whether it's OKRs, which are people are some, you know, very good communicators about what the vision of the company is. You have to make sure there's money in the bank Right, because that's also your legal duty, at least in Germany, that if you don't have this, you have to file for insolvency, and that's only the, one of the very few uh, uh, things where you can really fuck up and go to jail, so that's really something very important. And then third is hiring. And I think that is probably you know, something that is a bit surprising for people, but if, as a CEO, I think it's totally fine to spend 30% of your time on hiring, on recruiting. Um, and that is not just walking in you know, some interviews and do half hour checks with some people whether they fit the company, but it's, I think, about working to get the really best people, uh, those hires that everybody will go like, how the fuck did this per person you know, be convinced to join this company? This is a rock star. What does he do with a startup? Those are the kind of hires you have to go for, and nobody else can do that except you. Um, and sometimes probably it's a month, you know, it's a process of many months. Um, I think that's what a CEO should focus a lot on. And then I think part of the vision part is what I mentioned earlier, think about how can you really make this a high performance organization? How can you make sure that the metabolism of processing information, turning it into action, measuring again, getting more information, and this feedback loop, what Rocket was able to do with a couple of companies, get them in a super aggressive hyper learning mode, making sure that you have a company culture that says, we've been doing this for years until yesterday. I mean, if, 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 you, if you build up an organization which you micromanage, then you'll attract people who like to be micromanaged. In the yeah, long you don't run. want to work with these people. I guess not, no. Yeah, Uwe, it was a lot of fun starting a company with you today and yeah, being your yeah, co-founder. Um, thank you very much for um, this, this, this great thanks session. You. I had a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, thanks. Well, thanks very much for having me. We'll, we'll try to be helpful as much as we can. Um, if there's anything we can do, please reach out. We'll, tr we'll try to stick around some more. But um, it's a great format, so thank you very much to all of the organizers. I think it's... Um, <laughs> Important that there's people here who try to, you know, really give first, give a couple of times, ten to dozens of times first before they ask for something. I think that's what makes an ecosystem uh, strong. So thank you very much to all of you who came. All of, thank you very much to all of you who organized. Of course, also thank you to you um, for, for doing this. Thank you.